Good afternoon and Shana Tova for anyone who is celebrating Rosh Hashanah. I want to begin our conversation today by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place of many peoples, including the Cree, Nakota Sioux, Métis, and Soto peoples. And we meet today on the unceded lands of the Papas Chase First Nation. So again, it's a nerve-wracking experience to be here today. What I want to do is to offer some of my perspectives on where I think we are right now and where we should be going. I want to um, give you some of my thoughts on the current context, a context that I think is marked by challenges for sure, but also by opportunities. I realize that the past few years have left us all feeling somewhat traumatized. We've faced a, a budget axe that fell and fell again and always seemed poised to fall. <laughs> We've lived with governments and with university leaders who seemed incapable, really, of understanding the, the valuable contributions that we're making through our research, creative activity, and teaching. And over the past five years, we've shrunk, right? We've shrunk substantially. Um, five years ago, we had 380 faculty members, and today we have 321. We're now in a period of transition that is um, marked by change on, on so many levels all at once. We have a new government, we have a new president, a new provost, a new provost team, <laughs> and we have an acting dean. The turmoil of the past few years has, has really, I think, left us um, desperately trying to protect what it is that we do. But I want to make the case that now is the time to make some changes. Not in what we do, but in how we do it and how we defend what we do. It's time for us to move forward beyond the immobilization that has uh, so often, has often left us feeling trapped in the past few years. Some of you probably read with, with interest the, um, the president's op-ed in the Edmonton Journal during the first week of school. I did. And he wrote in his op-ed, universities are not only about numbers um, and statistics or job readiness. We play a more significant, fundamental role. We empower individuals to use their talents and skills for the public good. This is a new, or at least the beginnings, of a new presidential narrative on the role of the university. We're no longer being defined by an aspiration to ascend in the global rankings. Remember, top 20 by 2020. The new president is instead emphasizing the role of the University of Alberta for the public good. A university that is defined in relation to the public good provides an obvious space for the humanities, social sciences, and fine arts. So in late August, I, I went to the senior leaders retreat, and I spent some time getting to know President Turpin, as well as the new provost, Steve Dew, and members of the provost team, and all the various vice presidents, teams, <laughs> as well as the other deans. Now we had a number of keynote speakers at the retreat, and they all talked about the challenges uh, facing universities. Among others, we've seen declining public uh, support funding for universities, and this is something that is unfortunately cross-national. Even as we considered these challenges, though, I felt hopeful. I felt encouraged by what I heard. We heard from Richard Discerny, who is the Deputy Minister of Executive Council. So he's Alberta's senior public servant. And in preparation for the keynote, Discerny had spent some time reading Rod McLeod's History of the University of Alberta, All True Things. Discerny spent a lot of, uh, uh, he paid a lot of attention to McLeod's um, retelling of the history of government policy towards universities. And he emphasized the yo-yo budgeting that the post-secondary sector has faced really since the 19, early 1970s. He reminded us that in the past 10 years, we've had six premiers, six ministers of advanced education, or whatever they might have called it, and also six deputy ministers. So based upon this volatile history, Discerny predicted that 
we probably face a future that is characterized by instabilities in post-secondary funding and by shifting policy. Despite the plunging price of oil, which has concerned, I'm sure, all of you, Discerny emphasized that we have the great good fortune of having a government that he said is uncommonly positive towards post-secondary education. And he really urged us to seize this opportunity. He said, you can write the agenda. But he also warned us, you know, sort of echoing President Kennedy, that the best approach is not to ask what the government could do for us, but in, instead to ask what we can do for the government. So what is the context that, that we now face? On the one hand, we do, I think, have some significant opportunities. We have a new narrative beginning about the University of Alberta for the public good. And we have a government that is, I think, receptive to that narrative. But on the other hand, of course, we continue to face some very real challenges. There is, first of all, the reality of the budget situation. So despite the government's... Uh, the government's decision to increase the provincial grant by 2% and to um, cancel the, the cuts that had been implemented under the previous government, the president and, and provost have made it pretty clear that they intend to keep that additional money, the 2%, at the center in order to fund strategic initiatives. They've said the faculty's budgets will stay the same. And of course, we've already met, I mean, it's part of the the, the budget that we were given in the spring, we, we achieved a 1.5% cut. Now, I do think, I do agree that we need, we need funding at the center for initiatives. Um, but the reality is that because of the decision to push our salary increases down to the faculties, we face looming costs on the horizon. We have costs that we will still need to make in this budget year once the salary negotiation with Ashua has been concluded. So the message on the budget front, uh, front then is that despite increases in provincial funding, we are not out of the woods. Related to this challenge is the challenge of faculty renewal. Um, and this is a, ch and, and well, renewal of, of staff <laughs> as well. And, and this challenge of renewal is something that the president and provost have identified as necessitating institution-wide strategic initiatives, and that's something that should make us very happy. In the Faculty of Arts, where one of the few mechanisms that we have to make budget cuts has been to cancel um, positions, to close positions when someone retires or, or, or leaves the university, the need for faculty renewal is really, really great. Um, Presently, only 13% of our faculty members are assistant professors. The U15 average um, is 23.5%, right? So we're way below that. And finally, and, and this is something that I think we all need to pay attention to, there is the problem of declining domestic enrollments. Now, to be sure, this is a national trend. It's a national problem. And when we look at our numbers here in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta, we don't appear to be doing that badly compared to, say, the Atlantic provinces where arts enrollments have dropped by 18% in the past five years, or in BC where they've dropped by 8% in the past five years. In part, this is because um, we've been blessed here with uh, uh, good demographics and a younger population. We have kept meeting our enrollment targets because we have been successful in recruiting international students. But the reality is that what we're doing is we're replacing domestic students with international students. And many of our international students come here and choose to study economics. So if we look at um, uh, enrollment numbers 10 years ago, we had 1,300 more, we have 1,300 fewer domestic students today than we did 10 years ago. And we have 900 more international students than we had 10 years ago. So what we're doing then is we're replacing domestic students by international students. And as I said, because many of our international students choose to study economics, this has meant that we've seen declining enrollment numbers in many, in many programs, and sometimes this is, it has been very dramatic. So 
to sum up this context, um, we do have space um, to articulate our own narrative, and I think that's very, very positive. But this is a context that continues to be marked by budget challenges and by the challenge of academic renewal and by declining domestic enrollments. And I think when you put this all together, it means that you know, instead of feeling so immobilized, instead of you know, just um, trying to protect what it is that we do, I really think that we need to try and move forward. We, we, we need to do things differently. I'm not saying that we need to do different things, but we need to do things differently. I want to shift to uh, talking about how the faculty office is thinking about the way forward. As some of you might know, um, together with department chairs, we've developed a set of arts goals over the past few, little while. And you, know, you can read them up here. And they're, they're pretty high level goals, right? And when you read them, you might say to yourself, of course we want to offer exciting, competitive, and relevant undergraduate programming. So, so why state the obvious? We've developed these goals so that we can think strategically about the challenges that we're facing. These goals will help to align planning at the faculty level with what's going on in the departments so that we're all moving together in the same direction. And I think also that this planning, this you know, articulation of goals and thinking about strategies to attach to these goals will help us to insert arts into the university's academic plan, which is going to be developed over the next, or this, this year. So to emphasize, I think these goals can help us move forward beyond immobilization and beyond the fight to protect the status quo. So this year, we've asked chairs to think about departmental strategies that support goals number one, uh, two, and six. And so what I want to do then for the remainder of this talk is to talk about some of the initiatives that the faculty office is undertaking that are linked to these same goals. As some of you may know, <laughs> we are restarting the BA renewal process by consulting with chairs. So um, Associate Dean Alan Ball, Alan, who's in the front, um, and he has the longest title of any of the Associate Deans. He's the Associate Dean Student Programs and Teaching and Learning, has already had really productive conversations with, with many chairs. Um, and rethinking how we deliver our programs and how we deliver our degrees is linked to goal number one, which is to offer exciting, competitive, relevant undergraduate programs in particular. Now, I know that there has been some cynicism about the BA review, given that we've been working on this for a long time and that there, there hasn't <laughs> seemed to be any results from this. I want to emphasize that I think there is a need, first of all, to change the core requirements. That's one thing I think we need to do. And this is just me. It's not my colleagues, colleagues in the faculty office who've necessarily agreed with this. Um, among the U15, the U15 universities, we have the heaviest BA require, core requirements at 42, uh, 42 credits. And some of you might know Alex Usher from Higher Education Strategy Associates. Alec, Alex Usher was one of the keynotes at the, um, the senior leaders retreat. And he reminded us at the retreat that complexity is something that really, really negatively affects student satisfaction. So might this not be the time for us to think about simplifying our BA requirements? Do we have clear rationales for the existing requirements. Last year, we explored developing a set of BA requirements that were linked to competencies. And we engaged in some really important thinking about how our degrees equip students with valuable skills and abilities. But we nevertheless concluded that it was too complicated for us to operationalize these competencies in the requirements. But I want to say that I, I, I really hope that we do not lose this thinking about competencies. When we consider core requirements and curriculum, we, we often tend to first focus on what students should know. We focus on content. 
And the question of what abilities we want our students to develop gets lost when we focus on content. What is the value of an arts degree, and how do we produce this value? A 2013 survey of employers that was conducted by the Association of Ameri American Colleges and Universities found that 74% of employers see arts degrees as producing more dynamic workers. Arts degrees, as we all know, produce graduates who can think clearly and who are actually comfortable um, being within a situation of ambiguity. That's an important quality. Arts graduates can solve problems and they're able to translate their ideas with good communication skills. In the 21st century knowledge economy, communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking are really important assets. And these are precisely the kind of capabilities that we foster in the Faculty of Arts. Now, as a professor of women's and gender studies, I'm certainly not suggesting that we should surrender our defense of the arts to instrumental justifications, in other words, to how we produce skilled workers. I'm not suggesting that we do that. I believe that it's critical for us to continue to make arguments about the intrinsic value of knowledge, um, the knowledge production that, that we undertake in the humanities, social sciences, and fine arts. Post-secondary education is not about producing workers, it's about producing citizens. Citizens who are capable of critical thought, daring imagination, empathetic understanding of human experiences of many different kinds, and appreciation of the complexity of the world we live in. But I also think that we need to take the challenge of declining enrollments really seriously. This challenge provides us with an opportunity to better communicate the value of what we do in terms of the important abilities that an arts education produces. We need to talk about what we do in ways that are invigorating for our students. Offering exciting, competitive, and relevant programming necessarily depends upon excellent teaching across the fields, the many fields that comprise the Faculty of Arts. We also need to focus on helping students make the link between the qualities honed by an arts education and what is needed in the world of employment. How do we do this? One answer to this question can be found in an explicit emphasis on experiential learning. When I say experiential learning, I mean the broad, broad range of active learning strategies where students have an opportunity to apply what they know. Strategies like performance, community service learning, exhibition, travel abroad, internships, undergraduate research. The explicit promotion of experiential learning is a priority for the Faculty of Arts. And this brand new video promotes one of our initiatives, Arts Work Experience. The Arts Work Experience program is a program offered through the Faculty of Arts for students um, in their undergrad uh, degree who are looking to get some context to their degree, to go on work placements, to try their hand in the professional world and to get some experience so that when they graduate they have something that they bring to the table that makes them a little different than other graduates. And it's a great way of understanding what you're taking in school and what you're learning from books and what you're learning from your peers and your professors. and putting it to practice in the real world. I learned about what type of work environment I want to work in. I learned about the type of people I want to work in. I, lo I learned about the type of work day that I was looking for. And I, I learned really what I brought to the table. I wanted to get into an industry that I knew was hard to get into. I wanted to be in publishing. I wanted to work with writers. I wanted to work with editors. So with my first placement um, with Alberta Views in Calgary, I, I got that experience. I worked in the office of the registrar as a student recruiter and what I really liked about this position was it got me out in the community, I got to talk to kids, I got to talk about the value of an education, about the value of an arts degree. We're going to start um, the space tours right now. My other placement was with the City of St. Albert in economic development. I love what I'm doing. I'm working with businesses on a regular basis, talking to them about what they need from our city, 
uh, where they need their funding, how do they get together with other businesses and how can we help them grow and expand their businesses. Because I did three placements, um, not only did I get a job at the end of it, but I also built connections in other industries that I've worked in. You have the opportunity to try different things, to try something you don't think you can do or to try something you've always wanted to do but didn't think you had the skill set for. It's the opportunity to take a chance. People are looking for other people to make their lives easier. And I think a lot of art students have those capabilities and those skill sets. It's just a matter of art students and arts grads communicating that to the work environment that yes, we can do this. You know, you have those research skills, you have those communication skills, you have those composition skills, you have the, the synthesis skills, you have those abilities to take really broad social concepts and condense them into the subject at hand and to connect them to what is relevant. Once you have those skills and you can have those conversations and you can negotiate with somebody or talk to them about what you're passionate about in their company, that will serve you for the rest of your life and the rest of your career. The arts degree is one of the most valuable degrees you can graduate with. I think this is a really inspiring uh, message. And what's really even more interesting and amazing is that this is not scripted. This, this was this student's own expression of, of her experience. And I, I think that's amazing. Many of us would struggle to, to so succinctly um, define the value of an arts degree in, in the world of work because, at least for people like me, I've, I've had so few experiences outside the university. <laughs> but I have had a few, but not many. Okay. So what might it mean to provide every art student with, with at least one experiential learning opportunity? And what might it mean for our faculty to become known for this explicit emphasis on experiential learning? Let's move on to goal two, attracting high quality undergraduate and graduate students. Of course, the attracting high quality students, good quality students is really linked to, to good quality programs, right? That, that's clear. And I think it's especially clear at the graduate level. At the graduate level, Associate Dean graduate Tom Spaulding has been working with departments to develop an analysis of the faculty's graduate programs across a set of common measures. And he's now in the middle of meetings with each department to discuss the outcomes of this exercise, as well as to talk about some of the department-specific recommendations that this exercise has, has generated. And one of the interesting, there's many th interesting things that has emerged through this exercise, but one of the interesting things that has emerged through this exercise is how we've shifted away from recruiting master's students to recruiting doctoral students. How has it shifted, Tom? What was the balance of? It used to be 14 to 4 MAs to PhD. It's now 5 to 4. Okay. It used to be 14 to 4 MAs to PhDs, and now it's 5 to 4 MAs to PhDs. Obviously, this shift towards recruiting more doctoral students was linked to President Samara Sekra's focus on doctoral education. When we think about recruitment for our graduate programs, we need to confront the question of the appropriate balance between MA and PhD uh, students or enrollments. In most fields, uh, there is unfortunately uh, um, a situation of declining job prospects for, uh, for PhDs. And while I think on the one hand, this means that we need to really think creatively about professional uh, professionalized training and non-academic training within our graduate programs. But it also means, I think, that we need to consider the balance between MA and PhD students in our graduate programs. At a time when there is a real demand for MA qualifications, maybe we should be recruiting more MAs and providing more funding for fewer PhDs. Our conversations about graduate programs will continue over the year. When it comes to the goal of uh, recruiting high quality undergraduate students, sometimes the, the challenges can seem overwhelming, especially if you're paying attention to the numbers. Now, to be sure, we have large numbers of highly talented, really exceptional undergraduate students. And the challenge we face is to attract more of them <laughs> with diverse interests. We would like the best students to choose arts as their first choice. 
for this reason, we really need to be strategic about recruiting and also about marketing. And this is a focus for us over the coming year. This is a time when we all know, if you, if you ride transit, that LRT cars scream Nate <laughs> and buses scream McEwen. And this, I think, suggests that we need to take up the challenge of marketing. There's a potential for us to link up with a broader institutional strategy. I know this is something that President Turpin is also thinking about. He's interested in thinking about a national recruitment and marketing strategy. Because he wonders how U of A can really be a top Canadian university when so few non-Alberta students think of coming here to do undergraduate studies. From the point of view of the faculty, we need some help developing an art-specific recruitment strategy, marketing strategy, how we promote ourselves. When we think about this, we, you know, the first thing that comes to many of our minds is uh, going out to high schools and giving a talk about our, our wonderful programs. And that's good, and it can help raise awareness for sure about our, our many wonderful programs. But the research shows us that, that this strategy, especially if it's not done particularly well, can also hurt. <laughs> So I think we need to be more creative about, about recruiting and marketing. And in order to help us think through some of the issues surrounding this, um, we've bought into a Higher Education and Strategy Associates National Study to Enhance Arts Enrollments. And this study is based upon um, a national sample of high school students. It's a qualitative study. It's trying to get at student perceptions about arts and what influences students' decisions about what they're going to take in the university. Um, and it's also going to generate some arts-specific strategies. And we'll be using the results of that, of that study, which is supposed to come to us um, next month, in order to be really strategic about addressing the issue of declining enrollments. We need to better understand what attracts potential students and how we can promote our excellent faculty based upon these insights. Now finally, I want to say a few words about goal number six, increasing community engagement and promoting the role of the faculty in society. Our efforts to demonstrate the critical importance of arts, research, and teaching I think, <laughs> needs to include a renewed emphasis on public intellectualism. The commitment to building a public-facing faculty of arts is what informs the report to the community that you probably got handed to you when you were walking in the door. The report to the community shares stories of staff, students, faculty, and alumni who are creative problem solvers and who are making a difference in the world. Now, I recognize that public engagement is time consuming and it's too often devalued. Nevertheless, I really believe that we all need to, need to take up the challenge of communicating our research to government and to uh, members of the public. We need to explain what we do in accessible terms. Academics as public intellectuals can write for multiple audiences they can expand those public spheres to address a range of important social, cultural, and economic issues. Now, because I'm a, a feminist and a, a women's, study, women's and gender studies scholar, I'm going to quote from Audre Lorde, who provided us with a model for this. She was, if you don't know who she was, she was in her time a formidable writer, poet, educator, feminist, and public intellectual. And she displayed great courage in addressing the injustices that she wished, witnessed all around her. She wrote, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity to our existence. It forms the quality of light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change, first made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. Lord was a public facing scholar who in her defense of poetry expresses its promise of cultivating intellectual insight, imagination, social responsibility, and the struggle for justice. Without a public face for all that we do, 
we are vulnerable to these pervasive criticisms and wrong-headed criticisms about the irrelevance of the arts. Community engagement, though, doesn't just simply mean being public-facing. It also means being receptive. Community engagement is a reciprocal exchange. So to close, I want to end where I began, with the acknowledgement of our relationship with indigenous peoples. As you know, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission reported last spring, and it generated calls to action that are directed at many institutions, including universities. I'm part of a dean's group that is making recommendations to the, for the University of Alberta's response. But we also have a responsibility, I think, to act at the faculty level. And for this reason, uh, an ad hoc um, committee has been formed. Um, and it is charged with raising awareness about the TRC and generating some recommendations for our, the Faculty of Arts response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And you'll be hearing a lot more about this this, this coming year. Thank you for listening to my thoughts. Um, and so I'd like to open the, the floor for comments, questions, your thoughts. They don't have to be questions. I'd like to uh, comment on what I think are some uh, mistaken assumptions in your address. I'm, having been here for almost 40 years, I'm well used to being exhorted to do things better or to do things differently. Uh, I enjoyed your address and I found it inspiring. However, I think it's a mistaken assumption that if we recruit more students from farther away that we're going to get better students. Uh, all the time I've been teaching here, uh, the students are large, almost entirely recruited regionally and locally. They're outstanding students. I've taught outside of Canada, I've taught in other parts of Canada, they're outstanding students. You won't find better students anywhere. So I think as far as recruiting students of high quality, it's a mistake to think that students who come from away, as they say in Newfoundland, are going to be better. My experience is, my wife teaches in England, is that students who come away from away have got more money in the family. So that brings me to another point. When we're talking about going to Cortona or having one of those job placements or apprenticeships or whatever, I really think that that's probably beyond the financial ability of many, many of my students who have to work 8, 10, 12, 20 hour weeks while they're going to school in order to be able to, school, to, to complete school without accumulating tens of thousands of dollars of debt. There's some large elephants in the room here that are not being talked about and that nothing I've heard from the faculty so far um, um, uh, has addressed. So uh, one of the suggestions I make to be, I want to make to be, to make a practical suggestion here and not just sound like the old curmudgeon that I seem to be, is that the faculty look at ways of providing research money for undergraduates to do paid research uh, during their program or during the summer so they don't have to take that minimum wage job. And more and more of this is being done, I know, and community service may be part of that. But as I said, to, to, if you want to be more inclusive in this kind of program, then there have to be other kinds of measures. While I've got the microphone in my hand, let me go off topic and say that every morning I walk along Saskatchewan Drive and I see something that really offends my eye. And that is something that's going to be called the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. Now, leadership, as well as the discourse of the engaged employee that was one of the faculty's points, they sound like neutral phrases. As a professor of English, I'm well aware, in my, one of my hobbies is reading about management studies, is that leadership and engaged employees and a lot of other jar jargon terms that appear in documents like this actually come from what's called the New Public Management, ostensibly founded by Margaret Thatcher, implemented extensively in the 80s, still in place, ultimately corrupting even to the political cl class, which I think is evidenced by the, the kind of moral, ethical, and other kinds of corruption that pervaded the party in power and so disgusted such a large part of the Alberta electorate and is discussing large, disgusting large parts of el electorates elsewhere. So may I suggest that the faculty urge the university either to change the name of the leaders, leadership college to the Grant Notley Cooperation College, or at least to have it double named. Thank you. So, actually, uh, just after the election, they had just put up the sign, and I joked that they, 
they're, they're going to be taking it down because it's not called that anymore. It's called the Tommy Douglas Leadership College. But, you know. the, these are valuable points, and it, these are points that we're certainly paying attention to, Gary. First of all, I agree. We have excellent students who largely come from Alberta, who largely come from Edmonton. I used to teach at York University. The students here, are undergraduate students, are far, far better. So I completely agree with you. We just need more of them, right? And, that, and that's the point. Um, and regarding whether or not students uh, you know, from all backgrounds can take advantage of the opportunities that the, the opportunities I, I'm, I've been talking about, experiential learning opportunities, it's something that we're very concerned about. And in fact, one of our uh, commitments is to raise, uh, to raise, uh, uh, raise money for scholarships for study abroad. Arts work experience is a paid work experience. The, the young woman who was on the arts work experience video had done three paid job placements. So I, I'd suggest to you that that actually helps <laughs> to fund education. And I'm acutely and personally aware of these challenges. I'm, I'm the first person in, in my family to attend university. And I did it through working and through scholarships. I'm, I'm aware of these things, and we all are. We're, we're, we want to open up the kind of experiences that I've been talking about to all students. You know, I know that there's, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of thought that's gone into making study abroad experiences available to all students. There is financial support for study abroad. I actually don't think there's been enough thinking into how we could support, for example, students with disabilities to go on study abroad uh, experiences, how we could support students who are, say, single parents to go on study abroad. So we definitely have more thinking to do, but we are, we are definitely committed to access. Lise, I'll uh, follow up on a d sort of different um, aspect of Gary's question about students from away. Mm -hmm. um, what is your sense, what's your reading of um, Central in terms of any uptake to, or have you communicated the faculty situation of declining domestic enrollments and rising international enrollments um, and the extra support and resources that the Faculty of Arts direly needs to support those international students responsibly. Is it your sense that we're going to um, get any uptake from Central on that issue? Well, I know that there's a lot of emphasis on the international student experience, and I was actually talking to um, our uh, new international officer, Sherilyn Trumpeter, yesterday. UAI actually has bursaries available for international students, see substantial bursaries for international students, and in, in the past year, they didn't even give them all away. So we need to be doing a better job um, communicating uh, um, about uh, existing uh, international uh, support for international students. At a faculty level, though, we're also very concerned about the experience of international students. So we have a, formed a committee to do some really serious thinking and to generate some proposals about the international student experience. Because, um, and particularly since um, international students, the the uh, the tuition differential is is wide and wide and widening, mm -hmm. and we haven't. I, I don't think sufficiently invested in supports for our international students in arts, and I think we're compelled to. I think it's, a, it's an obligation. So. I'm a Bachelor of Arts student here, uh, majoring in art and design and minoring in computer science. When I was looking for applying to universities, um, I'm not sure if this is the right place to give my opinion about what kind of uh, programs I would like to see in the university. Absolutely. <laughs> um, when I was applying in the university, I looked into all sorts of places, and being an artist, I really wanted an art degree. And I've seen some programs at the extension faculty, which are certificate programs, uh, which I would have liked to see as degrees. Um, I've looked into the residential interior certificate, and um, it says the credits are transferable to a Bachelor of Science with human ecology major as a minor in interiors. So if the um, program is actually um, proper for crediting as a minor in science, why not in arts? That's a really good question. Have you visited um, the undergraduate uh, student programs office on the first floor of the Humanities Center? I think that you've raised a really important question. And perhaps we could consider um, making those credits transferable too. But it might be good to start off by talking to undergraduate student services. Have you done that yet? Uh, no. Yeah, but it's a very good question. But yeah, it, it's true. You, you know, 
the extension offers a lot of really um, interesting certificates that could be important additions to your, are you doing design? Is that your degree? Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Laura Beard, Modern Languages and Cultural Studies. I thought the video from Awe was great. I loved seeing a student talk about her experience and see her out and about in the workplace, so I thought that was great. And I wondered if there are um, plans for making more videos like that or opportunities to do that, maybe others from Awe or others from CSL or some of our other um, um, engaged student experiences like that, because I know we've talked about that a lot in chairs about wanting to make more um, short videos with our students and things about our program. So. Yeah. Do we have more of that in the works? Yeah, absolutely. And Great. and this, I think the AWE video is really a model for many more videos, not just for experiential learning like, for example, AWE or CSL, but some of you may have heard that um, we're beginning an initiative called Arts 100. Um, and Arts 100 is, is uh, going to be an online course for our students to introduce them to the Faculty of Arts. And these videos are going to be parts of Arts 100, and we're, we're going to be doing more of them this year. I know that Alan is going to uh, work, work with the Arts ATLEC, Arts Teaching and Learning, what is Advancement Committee, Enhancement Committee, Teaching and Learning Enhancement Committee. This video was made by a, a production company, and it's great. It's really well done. This student's words, it's her experience, but it's very well put together. and. We'd like to have lots more videos for programs to uh, use to market themselves, but we really think that they need to be done well and professionally. And, and so we need to get some funding for that. So Alan has suggested that we apply for a tea leaf grant in order to help us fund that, and I think that's a great idea. So he's going to be pursuing that with ATLEC. So. Lise, uh, Julie Brown Hi. from Drama. Um, can you talk to us at all about what you learned uh, at the retreat that you did with <laughs> those folk um, about the financial situation and moving forward. Are we going to RCM? Is it, oh, right, the budget situation. Is it for sure? I mean, they've moved us part way and then we got stopped because a new president and new provost were coming in. So do, did you learn anything about what's coming? No. They're at at the senior leaders retreat, the emphasis was on generating the kind of questions that we should consider as part of the academic planning process, the big questions. Um, and we were specifically told not to talk about the budget. So we didn't talk about the budget, we didn't talk about budget models, and there's been a whole lot of silence about the budget and budget models in the circles in which I travel. So the idea was that the RCM committees would produce their report, which was submitted to, to President Turpin. I'm not sure about the direction that we're moving in at all, because no one has talked about it. Um, so I'm sure there's, there, there, there are a lot of things um, that haven't been, like for example, there's been no discussion of international strategy either. There's just a lot we don't know yet. So, and I think, you know, it's been a huge lear learning curve. We had like a complete, we have a complete new provost's office right now. Um, we have a new president. We have new stuff. Like I think that they've had a they've had a real like <laughs> they've had a struggle over the summer, kind of you know getting all their ducks in the, in a row and trying to figure out what's going on. So I, I'm it's it's moving a little slowly. And um, but yeah, there's been no discussion of the budget model and very little discussion about the budget. What we do know is that of course you know this too because. Um, we all read the news about Bill 3. The government has committed to 2% next year as well. They're committed to giving us two years of stable funding, and they're going to be um, um, doing uh, like a, a study on university funding. So, I mean, you know, some ideas that uh, I think people are, are considering um, uh, include should the, the um, research intensive universities get a different level of funding than universities that don't do research, right? So in terms of the budget process, I, I like the fact that um, the president seems really committed to working with the other uh, uh, research universities in the province. So they're making a common submission. Um, so the budget process, the, the government budget process is, 
is unfolding right now, but they're together making a submission. Hi, Oliver Rossier from the Arts Collaboration Enterprise. And I just want to, first of all, give a quick shout out to the communications team who built this cute little arts news oh, yeah. card because, I mean, frankly, this is one of the most important things that we can do together is get our stories out to the general public and, you know, using these systems helps us all. So uh, shout out to the communications team. And then just back to the, the budget or near budget question. Um, frankly, one of the things that concerns me as someone inside the, the machine is these, these, these hidden fees and these sort of internal ben billing engines that start coming up. Uh, IST, for example, coming up with really high fees for doing things that, frankly, we need. I mean, we, we are here as you know, one of the largest faculties or the largest faculty on campus. We serve a huge audience, and then suddenly we find out centers, institutes, departments have to pay this fee that goes through the roof. So I know you're out there trying to champion for those sorts of things um, to be minimized, but it's, it's kind of a moving template. How can we budget and how can we forecast for events when new fees seem to be popping up all around us? Yeah, that's a problem. I mean, it, it doesn't help the university's um, financial situation at all for us all to be charging each other money, right? That's just about moving money around in the institution, so. But it is a problem. Yes, Janice Williamson. I'm a professor in the Department of English and Film Studies and I'm the new chair of equity for the ASUA. And I just wanted to um, address equity just for a moment because, and it's in relation to the provincial government, the change in government, and their initiatives um, uh, around equity and how this is a very good opportunity for the University of Alberta and for the Faculty of Arts to really foreground equity issues uh, and make us, you know, um, uh, proceed with our very best practices. Uh, and it's a rare opportunity in Alberta that this is a leading a leading discourse in, in within the provincial government. So I just wanted to mention that. And I, I'm also very uh, glad that there is emphasis being put on uh, uh, public uh, um, outreach uh, to the community and uh, the work of uh, public intellectuals. It seems it's a, uh, that it's very timely and important. And, and the thrust of the former administration seemed to, seemed to really uh, be on the one hand for um, what it meant to be a public intellectual and on the other hand quite disengaged from from the, the local and provincial community to my mind. So yeah. I'm grateful for that. Thank you. And I think that that emphasis on equity is echoing in the university. There's There are more conversations happening about equity and, and that's something of course that makes me happy. It, we have some issues and and, uh, and they need to be addressed. I mean, there are more maleful professors at this institution than women at any rank. And now, at least that issue, we can start speaking about it again. Mm -hmm. For a long time, we couldn't. So yes, mm -hmm. it, it, it is important that we, we talk about equity and inclusion um, at this time. You know? And I'm glad that somebody's paying attention to it in the university again. So. And, and as a an, uh, member of the ad hoc um, committee that is uh, developing the arts faculty response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I also am very grateful that this there is a lot of attention being paid to this. Uh, and also, um, a colleague reminded me recently that uh, it's really important to think through issues around um, diversity uh, with equity and uh, race and ethnicity um, and expand our understanding to see uh, racialization and social justice as something that matters to all of us um, at all times. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Absolutely. And I think that social justice should be part of art's narrative about itself. So thank you. Hi, at least Hi, Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay from History and Classics. Um, I know you've mentioned that uh, budget was not discussed. I just wanted to bring it back up again so that it doesn't get lost with the, the uh, change to, that the federal government made for um, immigration requirements for visiting professors and visiting researchers um, and the costs that have come down to departments for bringing those visitors in is quite substantial and, and quite frankly um, very labor intensive when it comes to the paperwork and following up with the visitors as well as with our immigration services. I know they've hired someone new to help speed up the process. Um, it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of time, um, that 
we don't have a lot of the resources to manage, um, as well as the dollar amounts that are coming out of our budget that we did not, again, <laughs> budget for because it came uh, late in the year. Um, and it, when it was being implemented, there was uh, very little information about a university plan of how that was going to be managed so that we can support our international um, involvement. And just wondering if, if there has been any further discussion on that, and if not, could, could we ask that that be kept on the table um, for how that can be managed? Absolutely, and that's a, a really important point. So the, the new process um, requiring us to do applications for international visitors is cumbersome. The university is understaffed in HR and it's taking, it's become a bureaucratic mess and it is creating costs. So I think it's, it's a question that we need, to, we need to keep on the table. And Lindsay, I'd really encourage you and all of your colleagues in ALAC to um, continue working on this and perhaps there could be a proposal for some assistance with the, the, bur the financial burden on, on departments. I've seen uh, coming back to the Faculty of Extension and uh, also there's even in Faculty of Arts there's many certificates, certificate programs and as a student of a bachelor degree it's nice to have relevant certificate programs which I can do part-time outside of my degree allowing me to do more than just my major and minor. But the problem with many extension programs are they're possibly designed as part-time programs with all classes being at night. And being a student totally dependent on ETS, it's impossible for me to stay downtown up to 9.30 and then ride all the way to south side where I live after 9.30 when the buses are all done. So um, if, um, if this if the class times are scheduled a little bit differently, <coughs> possibly full-time students like us can also incorporate such programs into our degree if they are credited towards our degree and um, timed uh, possibly for um, uh, incorporating into our degrees. Yeah, I mean, you're raising a lot of really interesting and important questions about the relationship between our degree programs and, and the part-time certificates at at the Faculty of Extension. And you're right that those courses are, are delivered in the evening because they're, they're trying to serve people who are working in the daytime. But that can be a barrier for access. Uh, yes. Also that um, some of the courses, like I um, mentioned before, that uh, residential interiors is actually credited towards Bachelor of Science. And that, which means these are full-time students who are doing this as a part of their program. So, they will probably be more comfortable with it in the daytime in, with, with uh, working out with their other classes rather than being at night where, when they would probably be able to do a part-time job or be doing their homework. That's the email that you can use to reach me. So can you send me an email and I'm going to forward it to someone who's going to help you to work on these issues, okay? Because these are important issues and I, you know, you're very motivated to be doing a, a degree program in the daytime and a certificate program at night. And you're right, it would be so much better for someone like you if, if those courses were credited. So we can certainly consider that. Um, Mikia Dorf from East Asian Studies. If you could bring back up the goals of the, the faculty again, that would be great. And particularly, um, I think goal number six is extremely important for departments and the faculty. Unfortunately, I think we've done a very poor job of that in the past. I don't think the university does much better either. And of course, now the departments, uh, we are trying to make efforts to, to increase this. Um, the challenge, as I see it, from for the departments is that um, there is very little support for this from the faculty. Uh, we don't really know how to do this in many cases. We have not been trained to do this kind of outreach, for example. What I'm asking is, um, what potential support do you envision that the faculty might be able to, to provide for departments? I'm also concerned that with you know, 14 departments going on their own, we may be duplicating efforts, we may be approaching the same group or the same people, and we're gonna look very kind of disorganized. So, so what is the actual strategy for accomplishing that on the faculty level together rather than separately as departments? I think we could work on a strategy. I think it would be a very difficult uh, task to develop a strategy, and that's because the kinds of engagements that we already do are, are multiple and extremely different. Some of us do policy-relevant work where you know government is an audience and we engage with, with government actors. Some of my work has been like that. 
um, you know, other people in the faculty are doing creative um, activity where they're engaging with audiences and with uh, artistic communities. Um, we have writers, and I, you know, I think it's. I think you're right, Mickey, that that we need to be more coordinated about this. We we need to have a strategy around this. We also have to think about how we can appreciate the work that is done more than we already do. So, I, I take your point. Um, I think it's going to be a challenging task, though, because because of the multiplicity of of ways we engage with the community or multiple communities, and and not even this. You know, we think about community. Sometimes I think people think, oh, it means going out and giving a talk to like a, a community group here in Edmonton but we en we engage with national communities and international communities as well right so well, I'm also thinking about the um, what are 50,000 alumni that we have mm -hmm. and um, again when you're taking that down to the faculty level then we actually or to the department level we're actually doing the same thing in trying to connect to our alumni right but if we do in the department level I would argue that we do need some support because we don't have the skills and we certainly don't have the resources to do it. And it's a, it's a big challenge and so we have to, you know, employ our students to try and help us get going. But again, we don't have the training, we don't know exactly how we're going to go about doing that. I mean, I think it is true that the university's approach um, has been to uh, centralize both advancement and alumni relations. And it might be, um, I think, appropriate for us to push for more devolution to the faculties because we don't have a lot of resources at the faculty level either. We need more to be doing a better job with alumni engagement and more to support departments in the way that they, they need to be supported. So you're right about that. But, but we need some more resources from, it, it, the approach has really been centralized, so. I'm gonna, carry on with that theme of faculty leading and supporting departments in an initiative. I, my, my drum to beat this year, I think, is going to be around the notion of um, that dreaded, awful thing that we all skirt around but will have to face someday, which is the revenue generating. I think, a, I think as a faculty, we will be better served if we can find a single direction in which to pull the ship rather than a lot of different departments pulling in each of their own directions without adequate resources or support. Yeah. Um, so I would add my voice to Mickey's on um, looking to the faculty for leadership there and um, direction as well. Yeah, and of course, Jen, <laughs> I made a decision not to talk about revenue generation in the state of the faculty address, so thank you. I'm for that. sorry. I know, I'm just, I'm just sorry. But um, you're right, I mean, I think uh, you know, it does echo Mickey, Mickey's um, question that um, departments uh, are, um, are thinking about and considering um, undertaking different initiatives, including alumni engagement and revenue generation, and there is a need for coordination and faculty leadership um, on, on these issues. And we're trying to do that. And, and you know that because you saw the revenue generation framework and we have a, um, employed a, a really great um, project manager for revenue generation, but we're, we're limited in our resources too. But we're, we're, we do have seed funding. So if departments want to engage in initiatives, we can support those initiatives with some seed funding that could provide that kind of support that you need, professional support. For example, around if you have an idea around pro uh, professional development uh, to help you figure out whether there actually is a market for that initiative. So, yeah. Thank you for that last question on revenue generation. And, <laughs> and the last thing I want to say quickly is please come out to Arts Faculty Council. Encourage your colleagues to come to Arts Faculty Council. We're trying to make, going to try and make Arts Faculty Council, I know successive people have said this, but I really would like it to be more of a forum for discussion. We're trying to move some of the kind of like boring sort of business into a consent agenda, so I'll tell you more about that at the first Arts Faculty Council meeting. But that would, would enable us to move through things quickly to allow us to have real discussions about the kinds of issues that we, we've talked about today. Because I think there's a lot, of, a lot of challenges that we're facing 
we all need to think about <coughs> solutions. I'd encourage you to think about solutions, and I'd really like to have more discussions uh, about, about these questions with you. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.